there's much material found in the Old Testament that can help a person today to be what God wants him to be as a Christian, faithful to the cause of our Lord. Today I would like to study with you concerning Jehoshaphat's apostasy, that is his departure from God. The writer of Hebrews warned, take heed brethren. That's a very important point anytime you see that. Pay attention. This is what I've got to say. It's urgent. Take heed. It's important to you. You need this. It's the idea of take heed. And he says, brethren, it pertains to our brothers and sisters in Christ, every one of us. Lest happily there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Well, that's interesting. These people heard and believed the gospel, obeyed it from the heart, were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, added to the Lord by the Lord Himself, added to the church of the Lord Himself. Well, why these words to those who are Christians? And as we studied this morning, those who have been regenerated, they're new creatures in Christ. I have to protect the belief in Christ that I have. I must protect my confidence, my trust, my faith in God and Christ and the whole New Testament system of salvation. I must do that because there is no other way of salvation. And he said, an evil heart of unbelief in what? In falling away from the living God. Things get in there into our lives. Troubles can come. We may not even at this point see what may come upon us. But they come. It's part of being a human being. We can allow those things to cause us to draw closer to God. Or we can let them drive us from God. These Christians were in need of being admonished. You are developing from an evil heart unbelief. Now, who's going to do something about it? They're the only ones that can. They and their brothers and sisters in Christ. So he says, but exhort one another daily, day by day. So long as it's called today, as long as you're in this world responsible for your conduct, brothers and sisters have an obligation to one another to exhort each other to live faithful to God. And it says, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. How is my inward man hardened to where the truth doesn't matter to me anymore? It did one time, but not now. Through the deceitfulness of sin. Remember, when you're deceived, you've believed a lie, a falsehood. That which does not correspond with reality. In some way or the other, you was persuaded yourself to self. That's all right. That's all right. To the Galatian brethren, the Apostle Paul said, you were, American Sanders says, running well. You did run well. Who hardened you that you should not obey the truth? Galatians 5, 7. Somebody influenced them for evil. They let that happen. They accepted whatever it was that caused them to be moved away from serving God. Or they were in the process thereof of doing so. So we can learn much from the Old Testament. And now I said we would focus on Jehoshaphat. If you look at Jehoshaphat, he had a great beginning. 
But uh, his bright morning became clouded with dark sorrows of failure. So we're going to look at a character from the Old Testament. We're going to look at both the good and the bad in the character of Jehoshaphat. First of all, we see the man highly honored. 2 Chronicles chapter 17 and verse 3. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked all in the in the ways of his father David and sought not unto the Balaam, which means the idols of that time. It comes down to this. If one chooses to walk with God, to stay close with God, in any and all times and situations, keep the commandments of God, then success is guaranteed. And in the beginning, Josephat did not let the sins of others become a stumbling block to him. A stumbling block is when somebody actually commits sin somewhere or the other or does something that causes you to sin. Now that something could be another sin. It could be something that you see a person do and you don't know any better. You need to grow, in other words, and you stumble at that and go off over and commit a sin. So he knew that God is the perfect example. He chose a deliberate purpose thing on his part to follow God. And God was with him, as he will be with everyone who walks with him. So there's a, a great point. If I'm going to be highly honored by God, then I choose to stay with God's truth and all of my plans and purposes and my actions. Next thing is we see Jehoshaphat greatly encouraged. In 2 Chronicles chapter 17 in verse 6, we see this scripture. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he took away the high places and the Azurim out of Judah. He's removing the idols and the places where they worship the idols. That's a good thing. When you consider all the law of Moses had to say to fleshly Israel regarding the sin of idolatry. Joseph had his guarding against his heart becoming consumed with vanity, pride. This was at the beginning of his rule. I guess you would say, to use the New Testament material, that he evidently realized that there are things in life that are vain, they're empty, they're worthless, they're not worth investing in. And he knew what was also taught in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. You know, I never, as a side light here, I, I never see the so-called, quote, pride parades, unquote, without thinking about this verse. The fall of all those immoral people is out there ahead of them somewhere they've already fallen in a great way but the ultimate and final fall is their eternal destruction and they don't realize what they're saying now when the devil can use pride to lift one's heart it certainly is not going to be lifted in a way that's going to cause a person to be closer to God when the devil causes that kind of vainglory to rise up, then it's going to be something that's going to bring about the defeat of that person and ultimately the death of that person, at least spiritually speaking. Of course, in this life, there's always hope there can be repentance. I understand that. But if there's not, there's eternal death waiting. God gives no encouragement to one 
who chooses, notice I say, one who chooses, not forced into it against his will, but one who chooses to live a manner of life that is in complete opposition to the will of heaven, whether it be moral sins or religious sins. Only when we choose God's holy word, which we learn from David in Psalm 119, verse 105, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Only then can we expect His blessings. We need not think He's going to bless us when we're set upon doing things to suit ourselves to ignore His will. Now remember we're looking at Jehoshaphat at some good things and some bad things. And one of the things we see him doing is becoming unequally yoked. We'll see more about that in just a moment, but that's found in 2 Chronicles 18, verse 1. Now, Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. Now watch. And he joined affinity with Ahab. Now, something's wrong with a godly person who want to have anything in the world to do with Ahab. So when he joins affinity with Ahab, I don't know what he was thinking. Sometimes we see people do something, get in a mess, and we say to them, what were you thinking? Well, I would like to ask Jehoshaphat that. What were you thinking? The Bible describes Ahab as wicked as anybody can be wicked. And it was the Savior who said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 19, 23. So I don't know if that's what you got here, that he had riches and honor and abundance. Then immediately it says he joined an affinity with Ahab. If one led to the other, I don't know. I do know what the Lord said. And I know no one, whether he would be rich, though very poor, or whether he's very rich or richer. None of those things, none of those things should be allowed to stop that person from doing what God said do, first, foremost, and always. Now, it's true that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, 1 Timothy 6.10. And thus we have to have a proper perspective, not only of money and earning money, but the use of money. Good stewardship means we're taking care of somebody else's money like that person wants you taken care of. It means that we're, as children of God, taking care of ourselves and all that pertains to ourselves and dealing with everybody else. Not as we would but as God would have us do. The Bible also reminds us to be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals, American Standard Version, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Now let me ask you something. With that in mind, and he had to know those principles, how could he choose Ahab, a well-known enemy of God, would you say he would be an evil companion? Well, he wouldn't be. <laughs> Who would be? Why would a righteous person desire in any form or fashion to associate with one of Ahab's reputation? Here's what we read. That Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him, 1 Kings 16, 13. So why become good buddies with Ahab? That reminds me of some of these folks that say, well, we can go into the bar where all the drunks are, have us a beer, have a Bible study. Something's a little warped there. You cannot mix righteous thinking and conduct with a companionship of those who don't have any desire whatsoever to do that. There's proper places. We used to have a radio program, and I said, we were interested in studying the Bible with you in any place conducive to studying God's Word. 
Now, we wouldn't be averse to teaching people who would go to places like that. We would love to teach all people, no matter what their background, to save their souls. But we can't go into the sewer ditch and sit down with them. Just can't do it. So a tremendous lesson is now taught. When one chooses the form of friendship with a worldly person, guess what's going to happen eventually? You're going to be in the fellowship with that worldly person's worldly ways. In 2 Chronicles 18.2 we read, And after certain years he went down to Ahab to Samaria. Well, I guess if you want to say or let Ahab be simply a category, meaning of worldly people, the ungodly Ahabs are always ready, always ready to have the servants of God come down to their level. Always. Do you remember when Nehemiah was building the walls in Jerusalem? There was the temptation to him to go to be with Tobiah and Sanballat. These were folks that weren't liking at all that the wall of Jerusalem was being built and the city was being put back in order. And I think we should remember these words are not just in the Bible to take up space and they were written before time for our learning, we who are Christians. But Nehemiah's answer should be our answer. I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Which tells me then he understood that if I start mixing it up with these characters, the work I'm called to do won't get done. It's a great lesson for people to learn. There are many things not wrong within themselves, but if we give ourselves to them, the Lord's works neglected. So why should a faithful child of God willingly depart from the highway of holiness to travel the path of worldliness, ungodliness? Christians must not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know, he, he didn't say, don't be yoked. He said unequally yoked. There's no way in the world that you can live in this world and not have associations on the job or somewhere with people who are ungodly. But even then, you don't make them your best friends. You don't company with them for reasons we've already noticed. To become unequally yoked with them, you would have to participate in with them. Do what they do. And that's the difference in being yoked. And unequally yoked, and it's the unequally yoked that is condemned. Light does not mix with darkness. It just will not do it. Now, darkness needs the light, the light of truth, darkness being a lie. But remember, light can have no, no, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. John spends a lot of time on that all through his epistles. So evidently Christians need this. Once we left the world, once we've obeyed the gospel, once we're members of the church, the world's still doing what the world does because Satan is not going to quit being like a lion going about seeking whom he may devour. He's not going to quit that. So I've had my protection up all the time. But then we look at Jehoshaphat and we see him completely surrendered no he didn't surrender to God but to the unprincipled wicked Ahab in 2nd Chronicles 18 verse number 3 and Ahab king of Israel said unto Joseph at king of Judah wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead he answered him 
I am as thou art. Let me ask you something. Thinking about what the Bible says, but I wicked a person, as we've just studied, that Ahab was, would you ever say as a godly person, a Christian, I am as thou art? And my people is thy people, and we will be with thee in war. I would want to be as far away from him as possible in war or any other thing. Brethren, this is compromise, is what it is. It's compromise. And it seems that that's always been a spiritual virus in the body of Christ. People compromising the truth. And it's always a killer. The moment Joseph had promised to help Ahab, he was worthless to the cause of God. And one doesn't fraternize with the enemy and come out unscathed. The Lord warns, He that is not with me is against me. Matthew 12, verse 30. I, I stand amazed sometimes, and I do it from time to time, when these people are testifying before a Senate committee or congressional committee, and they're having very plain, simply understood, pointed questions put to them, and their authorities in their area, they have responsible positions that demand they understand, and they can't answer that yes or no. Well, it's not they can't, that they're not able, it's that they won't. They operate and they live on compromise. Well, I realize in things that aren't necessarily wrong within themselves, we can give and take. We're not talking about those things that are necessarily wrong within, within themselves. We're talking about matters of obligation pertaining to being acceptable to God or not. And we cannot compromise. We must hold to it. Yep, yeah, that you'll lose friends. Well, just have to lose them. You're not going to be able to associate with somebody in your family. Well, we just have to not associate with somebody in my family. Yeah, but y'all, I had one fellow tell me one time, he said, You've been friends with them how many years? I said, well, I understand that. And I hate the situation to come to where it is, but as long as he teaches and practices what he does, it can't be like it used to be. Can't be. I don't know what's hard to understand about that. He that is not with me is against me. I only know of one way to be with God, and that is to humble myself and obey him. I can't transgress his commandments. I have an obligation to comply with that. It's my duty. It's part of what it is to be faithful. It's the singular part of what it is to be faithful. So we must always be the bondservant of Christ. We're slaves to Christ by our own choice because we can't go to heaven any other way than being shackled to Christ and we must make that choice. We're either going to be shackled to Christ or shackled to wicked men. So good beginnings are important. My, my, we wish everybody would make the good beginnings of loving the truth and obeying the gospel and being baptized into Christ. But now comes the time to stick with it to the end. Good beginning does not necessarily mean there's going to be a good ending. And we want to see good endings. Thus be thou faithful unto death, and you'll receive a crown of life. It's essential, if heaven is to be our home, that such a disposition of mind is formed, cultivated, and kept. So as we bring this brief message to a close concerning Jehoshaphat, a negative example, one not to follow. Then we want to simply say, as written in Philippians 3.14, as Paul would say to us today, because he does in the Bible, press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God 
in Christ Jesus. You press on and you press on. Well, you stumbled and fell down, broke your leg. Fine, it'll heal. Get up and hit it again. So and so got mad at me because I wouldn't stay home from worship with them. Well, there's an easy comment about that. They'll get over it. Yeah, but what if they don't get over it? I can get over them. Because I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I determine what I'm going to be attached to. I determine what I'm going to be emotionally wrapped up in. And when I've let my emotional wrappings go too far. I have to have the resolve to say I can read and understand my God's will and know when it applies to me and what it demands of me and do it. And remember, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, another opportunity. God, look at the grace God's poured out on you to allow you to live, to again hear a message from God's Word and have the exhortation and the pleadings by the mercies of Christ that you obey the gospel. You may, not, you may never hear another gospel sermon. You know, once you've heard the truth, God's not obligated to, to say, all right, we'll just keep on presenting it on down the line. Once you heard it and you know what to do and won't do it, the onus is on you. God's done his part. So we heard anybody here that's not a member of the church to obey the gospel of Christ and believing in him, repenting of our sins, confessing one's faith in Christ and being baptized into him for the remission of sins. Now as a child of God, maybe this sermon simply says, are you a Jehoshaphat? Are you headed that way? Or like the Hebrews writer had to say, are we allowing an evil heart of unbelief to develop within us to where things about the church don't mean that much? Fellowship with the brethren, that I could take that or leave it. Well, something's growing and developing, and it's not something that makes us draw closer to God. So you need to repent if that is going on. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. That opportunity now comes to you at this time as we stand and as we sing.